Hey everyone, Mr. Fransky here. Uh, so we've already talked now about volumes of similar cross section and today we're going to talk about one of the other kind of ways to create a volume um, by taking sections of a function and it's by rotating things around an axis. So first we're going to start off with a little bell work here. Um, if you want to see the solutions to all the homework problems, uh, I made a separate video. You can find it on Schoology. Um, so if you were struggling with any of them or you just want some more practice on uh, similar cross sections before the quiz, definitely a good spot to go. Um, so let's check out this bell work. Here. So region R is bounded by y equals 2x and y equals x squared. So x squared looks like this. 2x is a pretty steep function, has a slope of 2, maybe something like that. So this is our region right here, R. This guy right here. And let's see if we can find the intersection point. 0, 0 for sure. And this guy right here, let's see. If we have 2x equals x squared, then x squared minus 2 equals 0. So 2x, excuse me. Factor out an x times x minus 2. So x equals 2 right here. And if you plug that into either one, you get 4. So this point is 2 comma 4. Okay. So we're going to do two different uh, solids here. One where we have squares perpendicular to the x-axis. So that means they would be, if we were to lay it down, here's our parabola. So perpendicular to the x-axis means our squares would look uh, like this. Okay, so perpendicular to the x-axis. If they're perpendicular to the y-axis, then they would be looking like this. Right? Okay, so in one way, we're going to kind of have lots of squares that are kind of skinny. So um, uh, be like tall and skinny, I guess, if they're like this. And then if they're perpendicular to the y-axis, I guess they're going to be kind of shorter. I don't know. We're going to see if we get the same answer. Sometimes you do, so we'll see what happens. But it's not guaranteed they're going to be the same. So first, let's try it with uh, perpendicular to the x-axis. So here, I'm going to try my best to draw this region here. So here's our parabola. Okay, here's our line. Let's see if I can get our points here. There's our line. So here's our region R right here. So we're perpendicular to the x-axis. That's pretty small to see. But we're going to have squares coming out of here like this. Okay. So we said this was x equals 0. We said this right here was x equals 2. And the base of the square, we always want to draw one of these representative subintervals. The base of the square is going to be the difference between the functions, right? It's going to be this function, the 2x minus the x squared. So always top minus bottom function. So this is going to be 2x minus x squared. So to find the area of one square, it's going to be 2x minus x squared squared. Or if we FOIL that out, that's going to be 4x squared minus 2 times the first times the second is 4x cubed, and then plus uh, x to the fourth. Okay, so we're going to integrate that from 0 to 2. So integrate 0 to 2. Uh, let's see here. We have 4x squared minus 4x cubed plus x to the fourth dx. Okay, so that's going to be uh, 4x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth plus x to the fifth over 5 from 0 to 2. Thankfully, one of them is 0 because that will make everything go away. And let's see here. So we plug in 2. We get 2 cubed is 8 times 4 is 32 over 3. Minus 2 to the 4th is 16. And plus 2 to the 5th is 32 over 5. All right? And I'm actually going to stop there because I don't want to deal with the fractions. All right? But if you did, yeah, I guess you have to go to 15ths. Ugh, yuck. Yep. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Let's see what we get if we do it with uh, perpendicular to the y-axis. So in this case... Think about our parabola and our line. So instead of having them uh, with kind of vertical bases, we're going to have horizontal bases here where they're perpendicular to the y-axis. They're going to be coming out like this. Okay. So this time I'm going to have to solve for this in terms of um, y. So I have x is equal to the square root of y. And I'm going to have x equals y, right? That doesn't change at all. So right minus left here is going to be root y minus y. I'm going to be integrating from 0. Right here y is 0. Here y is equal to 4. Oh, did I do the last one wrong? I should have integrated to 2. That's what I did. No, we're good. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so 0 to 4. So we're going to integrate 0 to 4, right minus left, sorry, squared. So this, uh, the base of the square is going to be root y minus y. We're going to take that and we're going to square it. Okay, so a of uh, y, I guess this time, is going to be root y minus y quantity squared, which is going to be y minus 2y root y and then plus y squared. Now y root y, that is y to the first times y to the one half, that's y to the three halves. So we have y minus two y to the three halves, 
plus y squared. So we're integrating from 2 to 4, uh, 0 to 4, not 2 to 4. Okay, and we are integrating uh, y minus 2y to the 3 halves, and then plus y squared dy. I have a hunch this is not going to end up being the same. I don't think it is. Um, so let's see. So we have y squared over 2 minus, I'm going to leave the 2 out to the front. So we're going to have y to the 5 halves divided by 5 halves, and then plus y cubed over 3, 0 to 4. Okay, so let's see here. If we plug the 4 in, we have 4 squared is 16 over 2 is 8. Minus, uh, so 2, this is times 2 fifths. So we have 4 fifths times. Now if I plug 4 in here, we've talked about this before. Take the square root first. That's 2 to the fifth is 32. And then plus 4 to the third is 64 over 3. And I'm going to stop there. I don't want to do more. But I definitely can say with confidence that that's not going to be the same as this. So it's, note, it's important to note that if you integrate um, with perpendicular to the x and perpendicular to the y, sometimes you get different values, and that's important. Because you'll have different shapes of these things, right? Because they're either wider or narrower when you're looking at the area of each one. And so you're going to end up with a different total volume when you add them all together. All right, so... Nice little review there. Now I want to talk about solids of revolution. So these are things that you see every day all over the place. And uh, my first question is, how the heck do you make a baseball bat? So um, I actually was fortunate. I, I had a cousin that got married in Louisville a couple years ago. And I went to the Louisville Slugger factory. And I got to see how they make these baseball bats. And I had always known that they were turned on a lathe. But it wasn't ever really obvious to me that these were volumes of revolution until I actually saw this in action. So... The way I think about it is, if you think about a baseball bat as being on an axis like this, uh, try to get right down the middle there, the top half of the bat kind of makes this bubble, and then there's like this long thing that kind of gets slightly bigger, and then it cuts down. So um, if you take that shape, kind of like this, and then like this, and then you revolve it around the x-axis. Do you guys see? I mean, you kind of have to think in three dimensions. But if you revolve that around the x-axis, do you see how it would make a baseball bat? The, and there are actually all kinds of people that do this as a hobby. It's called turning wood. Um, and you, you do it using this machine called a lathe. And I'm going to show you kind of how it works. So this is someone who um, actually drew this um, in like a CAD kind of a, uh, an application. So this is on a computer. They drew this idea. And now you're going to see he's actually going to take it and he's going to rotate it around the axis. So watch what's happening here. He's going to rotate it around the axis and it's going to end up creating this kind of cool baseball bat. So let's see what happens here. Riveting, I know. You can watch the whole video if you want to. Um, he has a cool British accent. But there you go. So he rotated it around and now he has this kind of mock-up of what this baseball bat's going to look like. So the next step that he does is he takes it and he makes a... Uh, uh, pattern, right? So he has this pattern now that he had uh, printed out from his computer, and he's not putting it on a piece of wood, and he's actually going to cut it out of the wood. So you'll see, I think he has one shot here where he, he's actually cutting the template out. So what you see is happening here is he's going to have a piece of wood that's just that kind of like half of a baseball bat. And so what he's going to do now is this is what's called a follow lathe or a lathe duplicator is what he calls it and this is how they make them they have these things they're uh, templates they're templates that they have at the Louisville Slugger factory are actually made out of metal and then what happens is the lathe on the back here when I hit play you'll be able to see it there's a little wheel that's following that template and then the drill bit right here then will be the exact distance away from the bat that he wants it to be and it's going to end up creating this baseball bat so let's see here so you can kind of see again it's popping out right now and they're going to show how it's following along the base here so this is that piece of wood he cut into the shape that he wanted and so as that wheel kind of moves in and out it creates that exact perfect shape of the baseball bat and this thing just spins 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 while the drill bit is kind of whittling away at the wood. And you end up making a baseball bat, which is kind of cool. So um, yeah, hopefully you have a chance to take a look at the baseball bat uh, that I have in class. Um, you can kind of see how it's been spinning, and then it's creating this kind of baseball bat shape by using that pattern. Kind of cool. So like I said, um, you see volumes of revolution all over the place in your everyday life, and it's kind of given away there. But uh, these are some other things that are volumes of revolution. Basically anything where you can imagine taking a shape and revolving it around an axis. So everything, if you cut it at any point, you would see a circle, right? If you caught this pawn, this pawn from a chess game right in half, you would see a circle there, right? Or if you cut it lower, you would see a circle there. Anywhere you cut it, this vase, vases are a great example. Um, any of you that are into pottery, 
right? You sit down at the pottery wheel and this thing spins around and around and around and you use the clay and it's spinning around that central axis. And so if you were to cut it at any point, it would make a perfect circle, right? So let's go back to a less offensive color. Go back to blue. Okay. Um, makeup cases. I, every time I see girls with makeup cases at school or guys, you know, whatever, um, then uh, I, I think about how you can imagine this as a volume of revolution. They come from simple cylinders all the way to like more complicated nail polish things. But as long as you can imagine like this shape being revolved around an axis and creating this volume, that's what we're talking about when we talk about a volume of revolution. So, now that we've kind of talked about this idea of volume of revolution, let's take a look at something where we get a little bit mathematical. So what they're doing here is they're taking this curve. They're going to revolve it around the x-axis. What they're doing is splitting it up into rectangles, kind of like we did when we first found area. So they're going to take this pace, and they're going to split it up into all of these rectangles. So I'm thinking if you rotate it around, you're going to create these circles, right? And so what they're doing here, this is kind of like a Riemann approximation. They're using cylinders, so they're not doing it at like every point, but they're just taking a few points, and they're extending it into these cylinders to show what that's going to look like. And then after they do this mock-up, they're going to show what the actual thing would look like if you revolved it around. And there it is. Okay, so if you take that function and you revolve it around the x-axis, it's going to end up creating that kind of horn-looking thing. Okay, so um, once again, of course, the idea is you want to use as many of these uh, kind of cylinders as possible. And eventually you end up to something, I'm just going to draw it myself, you end up with something that is super thin and it creates this little disc, right? Just barely has any width. That's your dx. That's a small change in x. And really, you're just looking at a disc that has an area. And so what you're doing is you're adding up an infinite number of areas that are disks, and that's going to create this volume. Kind of cool. All right, so might as well try one, right? So what is the volume of the solid generated by revolving y equals root x around the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 4, and what would it look like? So first let's graph root x. So root x looks like this. Okay, so if you took this and revolved it from 0 to 4, I kind of cut it off here. If you revolved it around the x-axis, let's think of what would happen. When it's halfway around, it would kind of create the mirror image down here of root x, right? And so it's, this is going to create kind of this like parabola looking thing. It's going to have a circle on the top. I'm kind of taking it and like turning it right side up here, right? But like it would have kind of a parabola on the front. It would have a parabola on the back, right? Because it's spun all the way around. So it kind of has an axis through the middle here, right? And so it would kind of be like, like a searchlight, you could maybe think of, or like the inside of a flashlight is kind of what this would look like, because you're taking this, this structure and you're revolving it around the axis. It's going to create an infinite number of these circles, right? You're going to have a circle here, circle here, there'll be a circle here. And what we call these are disks. Okay, these guys right here are disks. Because each one is kind of like a plate. It's like a dinner plate. It has a little bit of a width. Right, just a tiny little width. That's our dx. But what we want to do is add the area of all of these disks up together. Okay. Well, there's an infinite number of disks. You might be like, that doesn't sound right. But when you have an infinite number of things and you add them together, that's exactly the definition of an integral. So integrals just do a job of adding up a bunch of things with an infinitely tiny width, right? So what we're going to do here is every time you have one of these, I'm going to suggest that you draw a representative cross section, just like we did with the similar cross sections. And we think, okay, well, what do we need to know to find the area of a circle? We just need to know the radius, r. Well, the radius is going to be the distance from the center to the top. What is that? We've talked about this distance a lot from the x-axis up to the function. That's just the function value at x. So instead of writing r there, I'm going to write f of x. That is the radius of this thing. So the area of any one of these at position x, so if I'm at x here or x here or x here, all the way from 0 to 4, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do pi r squared, and the radius is just f of x, so pi times f of x squared. So at any x value, if I just take the function value, square it, and multiply by pi, that'll give me the area of that one disk. Now technically there's a dx here because it's really a volume. It's a tiny volume, but we're going to do that when we get to the integral. Now this is the classic example because root x is so easy to square, right? That's pi times root x squared, which is just pi x. Okay. So how do we find the volume? We're going to integrate from 0 to 4, because we start at 0, we end at 4, of just pi x dx. Pull out the pi, maybe, pi integral 0 to 4 x dx. That's pi times x squared over 2, 0 to 4. The 0 isn't going to add anything for us. 4 squared is 16 over 2 is 8 pi. That's all there is to it. That is going to be the volume of this kind of searchlight-looking thing.
<laughs> right? Okay. Not bad at all. Let's try another one. We're going to use our calculator on this one. So this time we have a little bit more exciting function. The x cosine x is why we're going to have to use our calculator on this one. But what we have here is 2 plus x cosine x. So cosine x looks kind of like this, right? Kind of like that. All right. Um, and when you do the 2 plus x cosine x, you could graph this on your calculator. It ends up looking something like this. It kind of has like this kind of a shape. Okay, so you the plus 2 is what raises it up to here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go from negative 2 to 2. Negative 2 to 2. And we're going to revolve it around the x-axis. So when it's halfway around, I always kind of like to draw this. It's going to kind of look like this. It's mirror image, right? Yeah, that's kind of what the mirror image is going to look like. And it's going to create all these disks, right? So I always like to draw it inside on the graph and then also draw it right here. So I think, what is that radius going to be? The radius is the function value, right? Because it's the length of that little line, that little stick right there. So that's our function value. So the radius is f of x, which is 2 plus x cosine x. So the area of one disk is going to be pi times that whole mess squared, 2 plus x cosine x squared. Now what do we do with the area? We integrate it from negative 2 to 2. So we're going to integrate from negative 2 to 2. I'm going to pull the pi out. You might notice a pattern here times the function value squared, 2 plus x cosine x squared dx. Okay, so I'm going to go to my calculator for that. Keep them. Calculator, I think I got a T up here. There it is. So I'm going to add a calculator. Uh, that's fine. Okay, make sure I'm on radian mode. I should have, I don't know. I had to update my computer, so I don't know if I have my calculus document still saved here. I'm just going to make sure that we have this in radian. I'm going to put it in float mode. That should be good enough for right now what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to do pi. Pi is next to the h. Integral, menu calculus, integral, there it is. And we're going to go from negative 2 to 2 of parentheses. 2 plus x cosine x. I think I have to have a time, multiplication sign in there. Cosine x. And then close parentheses. Squared on the outside. That's very important. dx. Hit enter. Maybe a control enter to get a value. Looks like 52.4288. Oh, I should probably make that big first. 52.4288. I always like to go to four decimal places. Remember, you need three. Okay. So doing this with a calculator, really not that bad. Okay. I'm going to change back to blue, even though I'm going right back to my calculator, I think. But that's fine. All right. So disks in general. So if you have some function f of x... So it looks like this. Okay, so this is our f of x. If you revolve it around the x-axis, that was a little bit too high, I think. Maybe something more like this. Okay, so if you revolve it around the x-axis, it's going to create these disks. The radius is always the function value. So the area is always pi times the function value squared, right? So you integrate from a to b, wherever you want to start to wherever you want to end. I'm going to go from a to b, pull the pi out front, times f of x quantity squared dx. There's your formula for disks. Now, important things for this. One is that you're integrating with respect to x. We're going to see one more example with respect to y at the end of this, uh, at the end of this lesson. Um, but also, it has to be tight to the axis. Right? In a second, we're going to see some things that have holes in the middle. But for disks to work, it's got to be revolved around the axis, and the region that you're integrating has to be right up against the axis, right? There can't be like a hole. So it couldn't be like you're revolving this around the x-axis because that's going to create a hole in the middle. We'll see how to do that next with the washer method. And here it is. So what the hole? Uh, so if you're a trig pro, you don't need a calculator to do this problem, but um, I'm probably going to use a calculator. I'll show you how to do it without a calculator, but um, we'll, we'll show the final end with a calculator as well. So R is the region bounded by the y-axis right here. Uh, cosine x, that's this guy right here because it starts at 1. And sine x starts at 0 down here. So there's green region right here. So first thing they want us to do is find the area of R. Well, where do sine and cosine meet up? I think that happens at uh, pi over 4, right? Because that's when they're both root 2 over 2. So to find the area of R, we're going to integrate from 0 to pi over 4, top minus bottom. So cosine x minus sine x dx. 
This one we can do without a calculator, so let's do it. Antiderivative of cosine. The derivative of sine is cosine, so the antiderivative is sine, so sine x. The antiderivative of negative sine, well, antiderivative of sine, let's think, is negative cosine, so we have negative negative cosine, so plus cosine x. Let's double check on that one. So derivative of sine is cosine, awesome. Derivative of cosine, negative sine, awesome. Okay, so 0 to pi over 4. Plug pi over 4 in, we have uh, root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2. Minus sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is 1. So it looks like we have uh, 2 root 2 over 2, which is just root 2, minus 1. There's our area. Root 2 is like, what, what, 1.404? I don't remember, something like that. So this is a small value, a very small value for this area. Now they want us to find the volume of the solid generated by revolving r around the x-axis. So a weird thing for that is that um, if we revolve this thing, around the x-axis, what's going to happen? So we roll this around the x-axis. The top part, right, if, if it was just solid, if it stopped here and the whole thing was solid, we would have disks, right? We'd have disks. The whole thing would be filled in. But because we take away this little part here, we create this little hole in the middle, right? Here it would look something like this. It would be a bigger hole, okay? So we're actually creating, this part would be solid, right? You have a hole in the middle. We're creating are these things called washers. So if you haven't worked a lot with like woodwork, you probably don't know what a washer is. A washer is a thing that you put on like a screw to create a buffer between a surface and a screw. But a washer is just something with a hole in it. Okay, so this part would be solid, right? And let's think about the radius there. The radius of the outside one, the radius of the outside one, that would be the top function, which in this case is cosine x. The inner one, that guy, the little radius of that little circle, well, the little circle goes from the x-axis to the sine function. So that's sine x. So a big minus little again kind of a thing. So the area of the washer, area of the washer is going to be the area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle. So it's going to be pi times cosine x squared, right? Because so that's the area of the big circle. It would just be pi times the big radius squared. Then we take away pi times the little radius squared, sine x squared. Okay? Not too bad, right? So then to find the volume, we just integrate. I think I actually have a picture kind of this halfway around. I'm going to get rid of this first, though. Yep. So you can see we would have a washer. It would come down to here. That would be the outside ring and the inside ring just right here. Okay, so um, we can pull a pi out of all of this, and then we just have cosine squared x minus sine squared x dx. Now this is where I said that if you're a trig pro, you don't need a calculator. This is an identity that you maybe remember from pre-calc. This is pi integral from where? Uh, 0 to pi over 4, right? That's where you said the intersects, 0 to pi over 4. Cosine squared minus sine squared is cosine of 2x. So I think I lied when I said I was going to use a calculator. I'll just do it by hand. So, integral 0 to pi over 4 cosine 2x dx, antiderivative of cosine, sine of 2x, and then in front I'll need a 1 half to be ready for it. So I'm going to pull out a pi over 2. The 1 half is for the sine 2x, parentheses, from 0 to pi over 4. So the 1 half, because when you take the derivative here, you'll have to chain with the 2 out front to cancel out with that 2. So if you plug pi over 4 in, 2 times pi over 4 is pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So I have pi over 2 times 1 minus sine of 0 is 0. So it's pi over 2. That's handy. So weird that we have this hole in the middle. Basically, you're just doing the entire volume, and you're taking away the part in the middle. So washer method in general. If you have two functions, okay, um, f of x g of x, okay? So if you revolve around the x-axis, let's say that's your f, that's your g, I know it's not perfect, sorry. So here's your big washer, or your big circle, here's your little circle. The washer is the part in the middle, that's the part that you want, right? Because you're basically revolving this part around the x-axis. So your washer will look like this. The big radius, they call it often capital R, is f of x, that's your outside function. The little radius right here, that's your inside function, g of x. That's the shorter one down here, right? Because it's a shorter radius. So the volume is going to be pi, because we can pull the pi out of both parts. Integral from a to b, wherever a starts and b ends, wherever they want to start and stop, of big R squared minus little r squared dx. 
Okay, so if you use f and g the way that I wrote them here, that would be pi integral a to b f of x squared minus g of x squared dx. Now there's one very important thing. We've talked about this a lot. I talk about it in pre-calc all the time and with you guys as well. This is not the same as doing f of x minus g of x and then taking the value and squaring it, right? Because you can't distribute a square. Don't do that, okay? You square them separately. Pi times the big radius squared because that gives you the area of the big disk. Pi times the little area square, little radius squared gives you the area of the small disk. Subtract them. That's the way to do it. Okay. So this one's a little weirder, and we're going to have to use a calculator to do it. So to find the volume, we have this uh, 2 plus x cosine x again. Okay, so that would look something like this. I don't recall exactly how it looked, but let's say it looks something like this. Okay. Going from negative 2 to 2. But this time we're revolving around the, the line y equals negative 1. So we're not revolving around the x-axis anymore. We're revolving around the line y equals negative 1. Okay, so we have negative 1 right down there. So we're not revolving the axis, but we're taking this region right here, and we're revolving around this line. So you can see once again there's going to be a hole in the middle. This thing, when you revolve it down here, let's see, well, the axis is going to come to here, and then the function looks something like this. Okay. So when it revolves around, you'll have a big circle, and then you'll have a perfect cylinder in the middle. The inside radius is never changing, right? You see how it's always going to be like a perfect cylinder? So it'll be like a perfect tube in the middle of this thing. It would end up kind of looking like maybe a bead, like you would do a craft with. Okay? But the outside of the bead is going to be wavy, right, because of this function. Okay? Kind of a weird way to think about it. It's hard to draw. But let's think here. You're going to have washers. The outside radius, that's going to be our function right? Except it's a little bit different. The function only goes to here. My radius is longer, right? This guy right here is f of x. The radius needs to come all the way down to here. So how long is the radius? I think it's f of x plus 1. Now, if you have trouble doing that, do top function minus the uh, axis. So f of x minus negative 1. Top minus bottom. That turns into f of x plus 1, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is f of x plus 1, and this guy right here, the inner radius is from the x-axis down to negative 1. That's always going to be 1. Huh. Okay, so what we're going to have here is pi integral from negative 2 to 2, f of x plus 1 squared minus 1 squared dx. Now, you can throw that into the calculator. Because we're already running a little long on this video, uh, I'm not going to do that on my calculator. Uh, but f of x, remember, is 2 plus x cosine x. So if you throw that in for f of x, add 1 to it. So you'd have plus 1, so it ended up being 3 plus x cosine x. And then uh, square that. And then minus 1, integrate that from negative 2 to 2. And don't forget the pi. People always forget the pi. They do everything right, and they forget the pi at the front. Answer A for multiple choice is always just the right answer without the pi there. Okay. All right, so now, I think I have two more. This time we're going to revolve the same function around the line y equals 5. So let's say the function looks something like this. Here's 5. So same region, negative 2 to 2. We're going to revolve it around y equals 5. So it's going to end up coming up like up here. Like this. Okay. So there's your region. Notice the back end this time is going to have a straight line, so it's going to have like a nice smooth cylinder on the back end, and you're going to have a weird shaped hole in the middle. So here's our washer. Here's the inside. Okay. Now, finding the radii for these can be kind of weird the first few times, but it gets easier. So if we think about our washer here, let's think about the big radius. The big radius will always go from 5 down to the x-axis, right? The whole way along. The whole way along, that outside disk is going to have a radius of 5. Do top minus bottom, if you don't believe me, right? 5 minus 0 gives you 5. Now, the inside radius is going to be changing, right? Inside radius goes from 5 down to the function. 5 is all the way down. This is the function value, so that's 5 minus f of x. So if I wanted to find the volume of this guy, pi integral negative 2 to 2, 
going to be the big radius, which is 5 squared minus the little radius squared, 5 minus f of x quantity squared. Make sure you use parentheses when you do that. I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one. It's worth the time. Yep. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I have um, menu calculus integral. I'm going to put a pi on the front end. There's our pi. Integrating from negative 2 to 2. Um, let's see, we got 5 squared, parentheses 5 squared, minus, now in parentheses, 5 minus, in parentheses, the function. So our function was, I believe, 2 plus x cosine x. And that's where I want the square. So the square is around the 5 minus the function. Close the big parentheses, dx. Gives us 198.898. Goodness, that's big. Okay, but it makes sense. You're rotating it around a pretty far axis here, right? So that's going to make it quite large. Okay, so 198.8985 is what I would write down for that answer. Now, this is a great opportunity to use um, defined functions. Why don't we define f of x colon equals, um, what was it, 2 plus x times cosine x. Tells me it's done. And now, um, if I do this, instead of using all of this mess in here, because the parentheses, I got confused even looking at it, I'm just going to do 5 minus f of x squared. Control enter, and there's our answer. So it's just so much easier because you don't have to worry about all the parentheses. You don't have to worry about distributing negative signs. If you have your function defined, so much easier right here. Okay. All right, I think I have one more for the y-axis. So no calculator one. So find the volume of the solid generated when the region bounded by y equals negative 1, 1, and x equals y squared, and the y-axis is revolved around the y-axis. So people generally struggle with revolving things around the y-axis. It really works just the same. So let's see here. Uh, y equals negative 1 down here. y equals positive 1 up here. And x equals y squared. That's like a sideways parabola. Okay, so it looks like if we're bounded by the y-axis, 1 and negative 1 in the curve, they're looking for this guy right here. And they're going to revolve it around the y-axis this time. So it looks like we're going to be integrating from y equals negative 1 to 1. We're always integrating with y values if we're around the, or dealing with integrating in terms of y. So we're integrating from negative 1 to 1. And it looks like we're actually going to have disks because like the mirror image will be over here. So because it's tight to the axis, there's not going to be a hole. Right, it's tight to the axis. So negative one to one. The radius, there's a different color here. The radius is going to be this length right here, which is just the value of the function. So for any y value along here, the radius value will be the value of the function. So uh, pi out front. And we're just doing disks. So it's just the function uh, y squared squared dy, right? Because it's pi times the function squared, pi times the radius squared. So your disks are going to look like this. And that value right there is y squared. So pi times the radius squared. So this is pi times uh, y to the fourth, so y to the fifth over five, negative one to one. We could probably use some symmetry here, just do half of it and then multiply it by two. Yeah. So let's see here, plug in one, we have pi times one-fifth minus negative one-fifth. Looks like 2 pi over 5. That's all there is to it. Okay, that was a lot. So, in summary, if you're revolving around the x-axis, you have a function like this. That means that your disks are washers. The width of them is a little dx, right? The radius is in terms of x, because for every x value, the function height will be a function of x. So you have a of x, right? Limits of integration are x-coordinates, because you're going to go from a horizontal value to a horizontal value. If you revolve around the y-axis, so going like this, okay, your thickness is going to be a dy, it's a vertical. You integrate from a, let's call it c and d, from a y-value to a y-value. The thickness is a dy, okay? So, always draw in those circles. Draw a picture of it, say what is my radius, or if you have a washer, what are my two radii. Remember that you square them separately and subtract inside that integral. 
Thanks for bearing with me on this. Um, volumes of revolution can be tricky, but you just got to practice, practice, practice. There are so many practice problems that AP has on their website. So if you need extra, feel free to go there. I'll be giving you some as well. I love you guys. That's why I'm here. Have a great day.